continent and its people. And um, so that was one of the things I really uh, uh, tried to change. Uh, I made sure that whenever I wrote about any part of Africa, I made sure that the persons speaking on it were the experts, I mean. I don't mean Africans as decor, because that's a very, that's a very common thing. Africans can come by uh, to complain about something or say how they're a victim, but they're never the experts. For expertise, they call somebody in London or in at the crisis group in, I don't know. So it's such a weird thing because if you have to write a piece on Italy, you don't call Nigeria and ask somebody, do you know something about Italy? You know, you don't do that. But that happens about, uh, to Africa a lot. And that's why you get these distorted views. And that's why I think you also get this idea that the, view, the information we get about Africa, if it's history or current, um, it's determined by people, mostly determined by people who have no real interest in the continent being portrayed in a just way. Um, and that's very dangerous because it means that we don't control the story that's told about us. Um, and I don't think this has changed a lot because I left and I became chief editor of of uh, my own magazine, but uh, even in my magazine, I make sure that recently we did a story on the, the cyclone in, in southern Africa, um, uh, in Zimbabwe and, and Mozambique, and it was terrible. And so I, I wanted it to be written by a journalist in that region. Now that means that that's extra cost, it's translation, it's, you know, it's also not just translation of words, but also translation of the way of writing, you know, and how you, how you uh, transfer information. But I really want to do those things. I want to invest in that. I want to spend more money because it actually gives you a much better story and a different story. So yeah, that's the strategy I use. Yeah, because I was going to ask, so, so what's the way forward then? The way forward is we need many, many, many more storytellers coming from the continent being hired by big news organizations and not just as stringers, because this is what happens all the time. So foreign correspondents or even uh, correspondents living here or just flying in uh, will come in. They know nothing about Nigeria and they're like, I need to know something. I've been that person as well. I don't know anything, but I need to make 10 stories in, in a month and they just hire actual journalists here to and they call them stringers they're just helpers and they don't end up in the story but they're the ones doing a lot of work they have the connections they prepare things they do whatever and this walks away with the pulitzer prize the one you know from the west so these people need actual jobs they can do the same job you can hire them, you know? So that's what needs to change. Also, it's a very illogical system to me because you're paying three people instead of one and providing jobs here. Now, now, another component of this is the economic liberation of people, of Africans all over the place. What do you think about shifting the focus of the market from the West back to the African continent? So for example, um, these stories are being paid for by media houses somewhere in the U.S. and U.K. What about media houses here? How, how do we get media houses here to be to think about making those kinds of investments? It's difficult because, of course, media is very expensive. I know this. I know what it what it takes to make a magazine every month. It's very, very, very expensive. So you need money. You also need freedom. You need a government that will let you do your job and not use, use you as promotion or for propaganda. A lot of journalists in Africa, uh, you know, they struggle with the fact that they can only make a living if they also do a lot of propaganda work for governments. You know, they call it the brown envelope. Uh, you know, you just show up at this, just come to my press conference and then you'll have your monthly thing and then maybe you can do some other stories on the side. So there is the, it's difficult, I mean, it, w it will take private money. It would take, there's a lot of money in a country like Nigeria. Invest in the press, you know, invest in free press. Not just in, uh, I don't know, I don't know what people invest in, but anyway, but it, it takes a lot of private investment, and it takes courage, uh, and it's very, very necessary. And I think it will also help a lot of other things, because if you have the right press, it means you have the right investments. 
if you have the wrong stories coming out of your country, because it's, you know, there is a, a, a lens that, that it's, it's negative for a lot of other things uh, that you're trying to build. So, yeah, I think, uh, and also I think there should be state press as well, but that should be free as well, free from interference. And that is not the case in, the most, in most of the African countries. And Nigeria is actually well off compared to other African countries. Okay. Professor Ed. I mean, again, I was going to turn to history for a response, because if you look at, um, say you look at the anti-colonial press, in Africa or elsewhere, that was not a, we wouldn't call that a free press. In many cases, you know, journalists, it was difficult for people to write things or difficult for people to print things. Very often the most um, important and advanced ideas had to be, uh, it, it was a, a, a political issue, let me put it that way. You know, many things were not just in one country but even continentally. Um, things were smuggled into the African continent so that people could read. 